A very, very warm welcome to you all this evening. I'm um, having spent time with William Tuzan and Hugo. I know we're going to be in for a fascinating evening um, this evening, so, so I won't keep you for long. But these things happen with a, a wide body of people coming together, and I just want to thank a few people first. Um, our co host tonight are Knight Frank and Wigan Osborne Fuller Love, the solicitors. You've been very generous and, and kind of your support of this and the other events we've done around the sale, and we're very grateful for that. Also, like to thank the great and wonderful Nina Campbell, who has partners, partnered us in, in laying out and presenting this collection so wonderfully. So, Nina, many thanks. I know you've been flying all over the world, so great for that. You know, I know you're incredibly busy at the moment as well, so we're honoured that you could spare time to come here and uh, with your knowledge of the family and so on and, and host this evening with us. So, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and finally, I just love to thank the sort of Sitwell family. You've been patient, generous with your time and your knowledge. William, has only been brave sitting up here on stage, but Henrietta and George as well, you've been so kind in helping us put the sale together. It's really built a very positive energy about the sale. So thank you very much indeed. And we're here because of that. Thank you. Hugo, I'll turn over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out on this rather misty night. I came across Salisbury Plain, and I did rather wonder whether I was going to get here at all. Um, but it's uh, fantastic to be here, and having had the chance to go upstairs and look at the wonderful rooms there, I'm just wondering whether there's any possibility that we could get some local councillor to come in here and slap a preservation order on the whole thing. I think what Nina has done in, in laying out those rooms are so beautiful, I think they should be preserved in posterity. But of course, it cannot be, and they will all uh, head off all these wonderful things to new homes in the next few days. And um, perhaps I might just say why I feel so audacious as to be here to talk about the Sitwells at all, with two Sitwells, is that a long time ago, Cecil Beaton asked me to write his biography, and so I had the good fortune to meet quite a lot of the bright young things. I obviously knew Cecil Beaton a little bit. I got to know Stephen Tennant well, who stayed at Weston when he was young. I also knew the Youngman sisters, Zita and Teresa, and Zita, of course, had been very much the object of Sashi's affections when, when they were both very young and um, Lelia Westminster, and, and also had the pleasure of meeting Sashi himself, which was great and very exciting. So I, I don't feel I come into it as a complete stranger. But um, Susanna, um, when you married into the family, um, what was that like? You're marrying into this extraordinary group of people and indeed an extraordinary house. Well, I mean, I didn't sort of see it that way at all. Uh, maybe it's because I've my father was always in the public eye and I was used to meeting all sorts of extraordinary people all my life. So, and in a funny way, Francis found that rather refreshing. I remember Francis saying that to me. Wonderful. Um, but, and then, but you didn't live at Weston to begin with, did you? you, you, uh, you no, we lived in London. Yes. And it was only after my mother-in-law died and, of course, the housekeeper couldn't do it all on her own. So we were asked, will we please go and... Um, run Western, and so we lived in the side room, one corner of it. And what did you find? Well, I mean, that was before we moved through into yes. the house. So we were just, as it were, near servants' quarters at weekends, and it wasn't until five years later that we moved into the main body of the house. But it was so wonderful because we had those five years really getting to know Sashi. Yes. And, and uh, my children were getting to know their grandfather. I mean, that's very special under the same roof. Yes, absolutely. Um, and what was he like? Well, I mean, it was just a, a wonderful to be able to go through that, get away from the perhaps rather mundane life that one leads, and then move into a completely almost 18th century uh, atmosphere. Um, Darling, do come in, sit down, would you like a glass of wine, you know? And it, it was so sweet and so easy. And, um, and we all became very, very fond of him, didn't we? And you didn't know Edith, if I understand it correctly? Well, no, very she sadly, was... she died two years before. Yes. Uh, we, we, before, before we got engaged. Um, but Francis used to say he thought I'd get on very well, so I was rather pleased about that. But right. this, this, is, this is one of her rings. Oh, really? Right. It's actually the very oh, first yes. ring she ever collected. Yes. Yes. Is it for sale? <laughs> 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 I think 
I saw her just swiping it from that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. But, but, but you, you did meet Osbert, I think, didn't you? Yes, once yes. or twice, but he had advanced Parkinson's. Oh, did he? And, yes. Um, we really couldn't hear what he was saying at all, which was very sad. But um, so uh, just a bit too late, I'm afraid, and then he wasn't well at all. But of course, um, when you did sort of, as it were, take possession of the house. I mean, you found this extraordinary, um, very complicated female succession which had gone down for generations, even way before the Sitwells. And yes. I mean, that must have been quite extraordinary. I mean, you, you, I know you're a great expert on so many of the things that were found in the house and the provenance of them and, and, and things, but that must have been very interesting. What was, what sort of things do, did you find really interesting or who, who I mean, Lord Glenbervie or somebody was... Well, I mean, um, we, we, we were glad to take tours around the house. And oh, so yes. I mm -hmm. had to learn the history, which was wonderful, because I learned it from scratch. Francis used to say I knew more about it than him at the end of the day. And uh, sort of doing, tidying this house, because it was crammed jam full. There were a couple of attics that you couldn't even hardly open the door to get in. Fantastic, so yes. Things had to be... Uh, organized and so yes. I kept finding all these wonderful costumes, uh, mostly ladies' costumes, and took them up to the B and and so they would tell me how to conserve them. And um, there was a particularly wonderful um, lot of uh, waistcoats from the 1780s in, in brand new condition as well. But um, and so on gradually got to discover. Uh, and uh, there, there were so many things that belonged to all the ladies down the, down the generations. All their books, all their diaries, their needlework, their little ed trees. Um, the, one really got yes. to know them all individually, so the portraits were like friends on the yes. wall, you see. Yeah. And it was always said, wasn't it, the fact that it was, it was an, a series of ladies who'd owned the house, that lots of things stayed, which might otherwise not have done, for one yes, reason well, or another. Well, somebody said they weren't gambled away at cards. Or <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yes. Uh, it was basically, to, it was by death or accident. Because Suzanne yes. Jones, I mean, you know, I mean, it's always dangerous looking at the history of the house with my mother, because she you knows know, far more than we did. And actually, the most interesting tours were by my elder brother, George, which uh, his history seemed to bear no relation to anything that we did. But Susanna Jennings, and actually that's, it's the only, one of the few things that stayed in the house. Uh, the, her portrait yes. uh, hangs above the fireplace in the, in the drawing room, and it's actually part of the listing. So we, we you know, Druids wanted to take it, we wanted to take it, we went, you know, we would have been had up, you know, it was, it was it, so it has to physically remain. And the story, Sort of starts with her in 1714, yes. when she was given the, given a lease on the house, and then she she took on uh, uh, the house seven years later, given apparently as a Valentine present by her father because she grew up nearby, yes. and then through death or accident the house went through the female line as you were, as you were saying, yes, um, which is why there are so many different names, you know whether they're Healy Hutchinson, Heber, uh, Glen Burby, until it became sort of Sitwell in the early part of uh, the last century when my great-grandfather um, sort of inherited it from an aunt and considered selling it but decided after three months of going through everything that he wouldn't. Well, that was wonderful, but he didn't, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. so yeah, we, it was us. We had to sell the bloody thing a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we were going through the house, I came across this letter that Knight Frank wrote to my grandparents, uh, I mean, literally about a hundred years ago. Uh, where they said, unfortunately, we, we've failed to find a buyer for the house. <laughs> and I, I thought, given the fact that Mike Frank then got the task uh, to sell it 100 years later, yes. I think we got slightly less ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another, yes. And but Stella, you did a lot to the garden too, didn't you? Uh, well, I, I don't know that I do did a lot to the garden, but my, the bit of fun I had was the propagating. Uh, that's what I enjoyed. I, I pride myself on never buying any plants, so I think it was yes. to be sown and propagating for the house, for the, cons for the conservatory, because we had all these groups the whole time. Oh, yes, of course, so, yes. Um, when we used know. to come back from holiday, my mother would bring all these plants, you know, in, into the, the air, aircraft cabin, 
you know, in Corfu. The there were literally loads of little pomegranates. <laughs> but I see they would all then get propagated. Yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> and peacocks, if I remember rightly, peacocks. Yes, well, that was my bit of fun, was having peacocks. I had four different coloured peacocks. That ah. I think the white ones were most decorative. Yes. They were slightly less popular with the village. <laughs> yes, that I can imagine, yes. But it sounds a sort of magical, magical setup altogether. And um, I would be interested, really, um, William, if, if, I mean, I know that everybody knows who the Sitwells are, but how would you, how would you define the Sitwells? Why should we be interested in the Sitwells today? Uh, it's a very good question, and by the way, we're, we're talk, not talking necessarily about my brother, sister, and, and myself. But the Sitwells, uh, uh, one generally speaks of them as being Edith Osborne and Sir Shepherd. Absolutely. And yes. this uh, extraordinary literary trio yes. who emerged um, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, uh, three siblings who you know, sort of chose the pen over... The, the, the cocktail shaker or the shotgun. You know, they weren't interested in sort of country pursuits. They like writing, yes. they like traveling, they like thinking, they like writing poetry. And they were quite different to some of their contemporaries. In fact, I think they, you know, their association is part of the, the bright young things. I think sort of, uh, slightly sort of derogates their reputation of it because they weren't really bright young things. I know they were, they took their, yes. <laughs> their art very, very seriously. Yes. And um, so, so, you know, the three of them, Edith Osborne to Sheffield, were the children of uh, my great-grandfather, an extraordinary man called Sir George Sitwell. Love Sir uh, George, yes. the, the great baronet who married his wife, Ida. She was literally the next door, ne uh, she was the girl next door, the yes. daughter of the Earl of Lonsborough, um, who he met on the Crescent in Bath. And Sir George <coughs> married in his sort of early 30s, very much a kind of, extraordinary remote creature of the sort of Edwardian era, a man uh, obsessed with sort of subjects that seem to have no interest for anybody else. And, um, what sort of subjects? Would well, I mean, if you look at the, the works he's supposed to have written, yes. uh, and he, he squirreled himself away at the, in what was called the boudoir, Renishaw, where he wrote things like modern modifications on lead and jewellery in the Middle Ages. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the introduction of the peacock into Western gardens. Yes. Uh, the history of the fork. The fork. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, as a food writer, I have to say, I think it's the most brilliant uh, piece of writing. Yes. Of course, the history of the fork is an incredibly important history because the history of society and so on, but that's a whole yes. other lecture. Um, he, uh, he, the origins of part singing. And then an extraordinary tract called The 27 Postures of Sir George R. Sitwell. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, at Renishaw, he put a note apparently uh, asking that, uh, that no one should, should, inter should uh, contradict him uh, because he says it interferes with my gastric juices and prevents me from sleeping at night. <laughs> so he often would take his meals alone. Yes. yes. Um, he was mainly portrayed as a comic figure in Osbert's um, seminal autobiography, Left Hand, Right Hand. But the contemporary, I, I think it may be even Orwell said that it's like the best autobiographies, it's largely a work of fiction. <laughs> it's a sort of right. seven, yes. seven volume yes. book yes. of which right. he uh, creates this, this sort of cartoon figure of his, of his father, Sir George, who in fact was an incredibly talented man. He was an extraordinary businessman, a philosopher of gardens, created this amazing Italian garden at Renishaw. Um, but he also was a man of extraordinary eccentricity. He tried to pay for the school fees at Eton by suggesting he send, load, send down a train load of potatoes. Um, <laughs> he was rather bored of the, the, the dull sort of Jersey cows that he looked at, at, at uh, over the, in the fields and tried to commission a local artist to paint them so that they looked rather more attractive. Um, he, created a, he invented a revolver for killing wasps. <laughs> and had this amazing relationship with his butler, Henry Moat, who sort of sired about 16 children, <laughs> I think mainly from some of the maids at Renishaw. And These things happen. But the children bonded with the staff. Yes. They were terrified of, you know, their mother, Ida, my great-grandmother, had these sort of terrible rages. And Edith would sort of, you know, run into the, the pantry and she, apparently she would seek what, what um, was once described as benign protective custody in the silver vault. So, and the servants would say, quick, your mother's coming. And she would be hidden away for her yes. own protection. So they had this sort of, um, her parents were very oddly matched. 
And Sir George really saw in, in a young wife uh, an extension of, you know, he, he wanted children as an extension of his own personality. So he found this woman who had a long line of aristocratic uh, background, who had a, you know, a sort of baroque splendor of a, of a profile. And so he married a woman who he assumed would give him a son so the Sitwells could continue. So when Edith was born, the firstborn, Apparently he was sort of hugely shocked. It never occurred to him. Um, apparently before he created children, uh, he would read a tome of sort of unfathomable tedium and then announce to his wife, Ida, I am ready. At which point <laughs> the boy would be created, except of course Edith was the firstborn and yes. shocked him. When Oswald was born, the, you know, the church bells were rung. Yes. And it was an to get a more happy occasion. And Edith always used to say that her first love was a peacock. And he used to walk sort of arm in arm around the garden, and her father just approved of this and had the peacock dispatched. Oh, no, and she cool. said it was her first experience of, of, of you know, loss. So you've got so the three Sitwells are these creatures who come from, you know, a, a kind of eccentric aristocratic family. Yes. And the Shelbull was the youngest of the three. <coughs> yes. Um, the lesser known of the three in terms of his literary output, but I think. You know, certainly as talented, if not greater. I mean, he wrote 100 and, over 130 books of travel, poetry, and so on. Whereas Edith, obviously, is well known for facade and you know those poems. Yes, but I was rather disappointed that you didn't come along wearing lock three two four this evening. Yeah, well, I did pose the, the telegraph dude. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, honestly, the, the, when you suggested that we should preserve this as a sort of uh, thing to look, we want, we're selling this stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I've, we've done so much PR and dressing up as you needed Sybil's hat for Telegraph last Sunday. That was, that was a sort of final act of generosity. Uh, yes, but I, will, I won't ask you to put it on. But I mean, she was, a, she was an extraordinary poet, a very brave poet, and a very yes. brave one as well. Yes, and of course, I mean, uh, 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 as you know, Cecil Beaton, when he was young, was advised to make friends with the Sibyls, and that's what you need. And of course, he always took these marvellous pictures of them. Um, her dressed in these sort of medieval costumes and things. I mean, when you talk about peacocks, I mean, they're kind of quite fond of peacocks one way or another, weren't they? Yes, and she did resemble a, a, a she, bird. She did. She did. Sashi once said she looked like an altar on the moon. <laughs> yes, very good. Very good. Very good. Because in, in later life, he, he didn't like to um, submit his work to the critics, so he had his, all, his, all his books privately printed, didn't he? Yes, he was actually very shy. He wrote huge amounts of poems that were published yes. in Brackley. Yes, and it yes. was one of the you know one of the tasks of leaving the house. You know there were pamphlets and pamphlets and these little, yes, you know, um, quite modestly bound volumes of his poems. Mm. So that he would write these things and literally get them published in Brackley. So you know I think there's probably quite a lot of his some of you know some of his works remain unpublished because he was a very modest. Yeah, well, he, and he, I think he didn't like to submit his work to to criticism, which I can no, perfectly well understand. Exactly it, yes. yes. And you, you say you, he once got caught in a traffic jam, you were telling me. Oh, I was, I was only telling you that, because uh, he's, if, to, to my mind, he lived in a completely different century, which was just wonderful. We were, yes. I used to go into the drawing room and seeing him. And we were driving around in the countryside one day, and there was a traffic jam ahead. And so Sashi said, I wonder what they've all stopped to look at. <laughs> and I thought, what a lovely point of view. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Yes. It's good. And, and, and when he got older, I mean, he did get a little bit sort of forgetful. But he dealt with those things in such a sort of genial, funny way. I mean, there, yes. were, there were some once some builders um, fixing. They were on the roof, and he said, "Tell me, what are those intellectuals doing on the roof?" <laughs> <laughs> so he had a wonderful way of thinking about yes. about the world. But I think they did, because I remember Stephen Tennant um, received a letter once from Juliet Huxley, which said, "Stephen, do you live in such an ivory tower that the clock the clock only chimes when you bid it to?" And I probably <laughs> actually would have understood that, wouldn't they? They controlled their atmosphere in a marvelous way. Yes. So that, in that sense, it must have been absolutely lovely living in that house, wasn't it? It was, and also lovely to get to know him in that house. And to I get mean, to know I, him. My mother sort of said, you know, we were yes. very privileged to get to know Sir Shovel. And actually, I recorded quite a few conversations with him um, towards the, the end of his life. And, um, you know, he had you know, vivid memories of his, of his mother, who he was said was devoted and was said she was very sweet, you know. And, um, but he would sit in his 
chair in the drawing room, which is not for sale, actually, I've got it in Somerset. <laughs> Sorry about that. And um, surrounded by all of his own books, when I thought it was rather wonderful that he was in his dotage, uh, relaxed and amused himself by reading his own works. You know? And, uh, you know, why not? And funny enough, after my grandmother died, uh, there wasn't just a picture of, of her on the table next to where he sat in the drawing. There was a, a photograph of Pearl Isle Guile, who he was madly in love with. He was madly in love with all these ballet dancers, like oh, Nora right. Sherrick. He loved the ballet. Oh, so yes. Much, you know? And when he was very ill in bed, I used to, uh, I, I'd put his ballet music next to him on the gramophone so he could play it for him. You know? Lovely, yes. That sort of thing, yes. Oh, that's great, yes. And I mean, I know he was um, very much in love with Zita Jungmann because I overheard a conversation that he was having with one of his his contemporaries, and then he'd seen Zita, and of course by that stage she was, did you ever meet her or not? He, um, she was just a little old lady, you know, sort of, you might, uh, well, be so careful what I say these days, but it, shopping in Cheltenham, you know, in a, in a sort of camel hair coat, with the tea cosy on her head, that would be quite likely Zita. Not at all what he remembered from the early days, and he was rather distressed by that. <laughs> yes. It wasn't quite how he remembered her, you know, wanted to remember her, but I mean, it's quite fun, they did get together and meet each other in, in later life. Now, I have, I'm going to put something very mischievous to you, William, if I may. Um, I have a friend, Lawrence Minot, who I think you probably both know, and he sketched both um, uh, Sashi and also William Walton. And he is absolutely convinced that they have the same lines in their face and the same things. And as you know, William Walton was very much taken up by the Sitwells. And he, he is convinced that he was a Sitwell. Um, discuss. <laughs> well, I think it's, a, it's, it's an amazing idea, and there certainly was a likeness. Um, Walton, who you know, is this wonderful composer mm. and a great composer of film music, actually, um, it's really worth listening to his music for Henry V. Absolutely. Which you can't yeah. really, you don't really hear in the original Olivier um, film. It's worth getting the soundtrack, you know, his, his music for Belshazzar's Feast is extraordinary. Um, his music for Facade is, uh, which he literally he wrote in his sort of late teens, early twenties, shows you know, a remarkable uh, instinct and natural yes. talent as yes. he mixed different genre of classical and jazz together for, to, for, for Facade. And he, and his coronation people, music too. Well, exactly. Yeah, and people, well, yeah, I think yes. at the time joked that he looked like a, a fourth sit one. And I think that, you know, Sashi was drawn to him, um, you know, unless we, you know, but I mean, I'm interested to hear more what you say, but they met at Oxford. And I think that Sashi found him an amusing, rather different sort of contemporary because they came from rather different backgrounds. You know, Walton was an organ scholar from Lancashire and Sashi was a toff. And I think that, you know, meeting people who had similar interests of you from different Talented, backgrounds is yes. one of the wonderful things that happens when, yes. you, when you get out of the sheltered world into something like university. Yes. And they did sort of adopt Walton. Yes. Um, and, you know, if he wasn't actually a brother, they certainly treated him like one. Yes. And, you know, he came to live with them in, uh, in Chelsea in London. And, you know, when Edith had started experimenting with uh, her facade poems, uh, Osbert suggested to, to William Walton that he wrote the music to it. And he was sort of a bit, you know, you know it didn't sort of, it didn't bite, uh, didn't take the bait. And then Osbert said, oh, fine, we'll get Constant Lambert to do it. At which point Walton said, I'll do it. <laughs> and, and then, and I don't know if you, you know, Facade is the most amazing uh, uh, spectacle for the ear. It's what I call early white rap. And it really is that because it's about it's about sound and you know Edith talks about the mixture of assonance and dissonance and the experiments experiments in words. Um, so let's come to the drama of Babylon. Hobby was his phone in the dumb scattered on Osiris glum. Watch the courses of the breakers rocking horses and Macrocus Lady Venus on the set of the horse hair sea. You are risen, Madam Venus, for a sake from far came the fat and circuit emperor from Zanzibar. We like golden bookers laid by Asia, Africa, Cafe, and Labour for that shady lady by the fire boy Shah. Now, I've no idea. <laughs> facade is that it is this sort of a crazy vision and words and rhythm yes. and it's, it demonstrates Edith's extraordinary musicality actually. Some said that she could have been a great pianist, not just because he had amazing yes. hands, but she had an extraordinary talent with words and um, I think it's very fortuitous that Walton met them but uh, yeah, nice, uh, nice idea. 
We don't think Sir George ever travelled up to Lancashire. Really straight <laughs> well, I don't think he had to go straight too far to go to Lancashire, because he was uh, in the north oh. anyway. But I think he was, uh, no, I'm just, it's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you got? What else have you got? <laughs> uh, well, uh, if you press me, of course, they, 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 when all those old bright young things when they were old, they kept referring to Gertrude, and Gertrude was the name. You've been there forever, yes? Yes, it uh, came uh, originally as, as my mother was lady's maid, age 16. Right. In the local village up at Brennanshaw. Well, when I did my... I love to plug something on it. When I did my book, Malice in Wonderland, the lawyers made me take out a reference to a conversation between, I think, Lelia and... and it wouldn't have been Sashi, but it must have been Taylor's Phillips or somebody, um, saying um, that they called her Gertrude Lady Sitwell, and they wondered very much about her niece. Did you ever hear that? No, no. Yes. no. 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 I would say actually, it's just off the record, right? Yes. Um, yes. There was a, a great local uh, farmer and hunting man in the village called John Busby who actually died literally two weeks ago. And I remember he said to me once, you once saw Sashi walking down the village street um, and he, pot he patted a young boy on the head. And John said, oh, I didn't know you know that young boy. He said, well, you never know. It could be one of yours. What <laughs> 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 did you make of Edith and Chelichev? Because you've got quite a lot of rather lovely Chelichevs in the cell, haven't you? Um, well, it was, a, it was an extraordinary, sort of rather agonising relationship. Yes. And I think that, you know, Pavel Chelichev, uh, amazing artist, Russian artist, uh, and there are a lot of works in, and, and I think, um, funny enough, there is a, an amazing sketch that I remember we looked at in one of those amazing great files that I don't think any of us realised was a cheddar chap. It's a, a sort of slightly chubby faced man, and the, you know, the, the, the page is sort of torn and cut up a bit. And I think it's on for about 1,500 to 2,000. They should wake it in, But um, cheddar chap and Edith had this sort of extraordinary platonic relationship. Uh, Chelichev was gay, Edith was, as Elizabeth, Elizabeth Salter once wrote, returned unopened. They had this extraordinary, they wrote to each other these love letters, passionate love letters. Yes. Um, but, also, but actually, if you read the letters between the siblings, they also wrote passionately to each other because they were great encouragers of each other's works. Yes. There was no greater champion of each other than, than the siblings themselves. And, but I think Chelichev, in later in life, sort of found, <coughs> was found it embarrassing. If you read Richard Green's amazing biography of, of Edith, which came out about 10, 15 years ago, and if you're interested in her, that is the book to get. And, and there was a lot of, you know, he, got, he got his hands on all the unpublished letters uh, from Chelichev that oh, right. had, had hitherto yes. not been seen. Yes. And, you know, Edith went and found him in New York and I think he tried to sort of shrug her off, was embarrassed by the relationship. But I think in the early days it was certainly, you know, very fruitful because they encouraged each other and pushed each other to create more and more, you know, uh, evocative art, or both in terms of her words and his, his, uh, his, his paintings. Yes. But I think... The collection that are, that's in the sale is certainly, you know, worth a look because um, he was a great talent. He certainly was. He's absolutely fabulous. Um, I want to get you to tell me about Lord Glen Burby. Oh, right. Well, there he is. I think he's up down there. Yes. yes. And um, I am rather intrigued by him. She married the daughter of Lord North. Yes. And um, she became Lady of the Bedchamber. And Princess of Wales absolutely loved her because although she was very plain, she had a tremendous sense of humour. She was the one person that she would take criticism from. Mm. And, and, and there, Lady Glen Burby, I remember she said, um, this has been reading Glen Burby's diaries, the duties of a lady of the bedchamber are to sit at the worst place at table, uh, to talk to the most disagreeable person, <laughs> and to make everybody do what they didn't want. I think that's so, probably the duty of a lady in waiting these days. Yes, I think <laughs> probably it is, yes, yes, exactly, yes. But um, to his <laughs> enormous pleasure, he was made, uh, while he was in Paris, he came back from Paris and he found he'd been asked to belong to what he described as the club. Yes. I'll never discover what it was. But the intriguing thing was that he described three people who were there. And all those three people 
turned out to be very involved in Western as time went on. Um, the first person was Richard Heber, who married the, the granddaughter of the original owner. Yes. And, um, and then well, they were great friends with Sir Joseph Fact, and that was the second person that he described. And I think it was as, as a result of their friendship that his daughter bought this lovely um, dinner service, which is upstairs here. And then uh, the house then got passed to his granddaughter, who married Lord Glen Burby's son. So, uh, you know, right. it, was, yes. it got really involved, and she then yes. um, added to that lovely service. Yes. Yeah. That's what's so fascinating about Western is all these links and things. I remember when I was doing the catalogue, looking at the, the entry of the catalogue, trying to work out on the family tree how they did all sort of manage to, yes. um, as you say, they usually through, through death and in, in inheritance and that sort of thing. It's very interesting. Um, I'm wondering whether perhaps people would like to ask some questions. I, uh, I know that the Instagrammers who have joined us probably can't ask any questions. So we are, there are they Instagrammers. They can't ask questions, but they can only take pictures. Is that your point? I think so. That's <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. They can take pictures. But they are with us, and I should have uh, greeted them earlier on, but I didn't want to make you nervous. But has anybody got any questions? You have a wonderful opportunity here because you've got somebody who lived in the house for years and years and years, restored it lovingly and cared for it absolutely beautifully. And you've also got her son, who is, we've already seen as a considerable expert, on all these fantastic characters, whenever you're going to get this opportunity again. Does anybody like to ask any questions? It only takes one and then they all follow. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Stephen. Me? Yeah, you ask a question. I, I, I thought you were going to ask. No, they, well, what, what, of all the things you're selling, what is, what, Susanna and William, is the thing that you... Oh, I got it out of very difficult question. <laughs> Um, I or, loved or a particular thing. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the Tieplo, for example, and how that came, because that's such a special story. Well, it was Henrietta who discovered that. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen it before, so goodness knows where that turned up from. But, but um, <laughs> there was also the Ottoman Atlas. Where did that? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I had seen that before, but I hadn't realised its value. But um, Henrietta should be telling us about the Tieplo. Well, it was in the attic, wasn't it? Of course, yes. yes. Yeah. Lying in a corner wrapped in bubble wrap. <laughs> so, Fantastic. Yeah. Which is yes. amazing. Mm -hmm. What would you... No, but I mean, Henrietta spotted that it was something very special. Um, so, you know, she's got a very good eye. What's well, a lovely thing to find. Yeah. I mean, they always yeah. say it's in the attic, isn't it, but where you find these, yeah. these treasures. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say, William? What would you... God, it's it's really, it is a really hard question. Um, these, these chairs, by the way, for mine, <laughs> I, I broke one of them. I don't even know. You could give a discount, really, if you wanted to have them. Um, well, I, I mean, I actually, <laughs> we had two of them with, uh, new ones made because there weren't quite enough for our house in London. So I actually painted that dark green myself. <laughs> and, uh, and Roland Pym was still alive. And um, I don't know if that's the one that was the reproduction, but, but luckily he was able to then uh, do the decorating to match the other ones that he'd done right. earlier on yes. for Mr. Osborne. Yes. But um, um, no, I mean, there are so many wonderful things. I mean, my brother and sister and I were lucky enough that we, we took a few things to our own homes. and. It was a great catharsis, I mean, because we had this last, final, fairly sort of terrible week when we were packing up the house, which is, you know, which was I do painful. Think, yes. and, uh, it was, I don't know, it, it was a sort of, there's an excitement, but it's rather like a family funeral. Do you know that kind of heightened excitement, drama, but yes. actually it's pretty bloody gloomy? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you have to kind of keep... Yeah, but you're getting out of the house, you know. You've got to keep your spirits uh, up. Yes, and, yes. and, you know, there, there were so many things in that house. I mean... You have to remember that, you know, for 300 years, by sort of direct indirect descent, the family had, you know, families had lived there. So there was never a sort of major call out. And because it was a relatively large house, um, you know, one's ancestors and relatives, until recently, you know, were always saying, oh, don't worry, I'll sort that for you. You know, so there was so much yes. clobber everywhere yes. Yes. that when we were, you know, then trying to move out, I mean, I think by the final Friday, I opened another cupboard in the kitchen. I thought, oh my God, you know, another, more stuff. And I just thought, oh God, this is it. I can't do this anymore. But I, you know, 
it's hard to put one's finger on you know, specific things that are in the auction. Uh, but I would say there is a group of specific things that I think are magical, and that's the library. Yes. Um, the library itself is my favourite room of the house. It had, uh, a, you know, a peculiar English charm, a smell. It was a room that really felt like a kind of time capsule. And you went in there, and it was it was quiet, and had that lovely smell of books. My mother had repainted them the, the, the shelves green, regilded sort of you know corners of the shelves. My father had yes. got Nad Bass to go through all the books. Yes. They were actually in very very good condition. Um, but as a room it, in itself, I mean, it may have horrified my mother when I lived there. We put a telly in there. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think you've got to live in a room. I mean, yeah. you know, just pass through it. But um, it made a very nice room to watch telly in, actually. And there's a there's a green sort of side chair upstairs. I think uh, it's a sort of chair that sits in a corner, which yes. is a lovely room, the chair for sitting. is actually very very comfortable. But it was a it's a wonderful room, and the idea of all those. Those books, and so many of them have, uh, you know, individually, now that we see them prized apart into different lots, you know, one then realises that it's not, it wasn't just a beautiful room, it's a very important room. Yes. There was um, the, the brilliant lady here who's been piecing together the, 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 the library as it is here, uh, said that, you know, she's had visits, visits from antiquarian booksellers in London who say this is a seriously exciting collection. Um, there's one part of the collection that isn't being sold that I swiped, actually, mm -hmm. and that was some of Susanna Jennings' books from the early um, 18th century, mid-18th century. And it's important to me because there's an unwritten story, which is about the story of a, a kitchen maid who came to work at Weston in about 1730. And uh, her father had been the gardener at Susanna Jennings' Um, house where she grew up in the nearby Marston St. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, the Blankos. The Blankos. Yes. And uh, she came to work there. She'd had a particularly unpleasant previous employer. But when she came to live at Weston, she found this relatively young, widowed woman named Susanna Jennings, who came come there with her three children. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think the two of them sort of had an affinity uh, towards each other. Um, Susanna discovered that Mary had a talent to write, and she allowed her access to her books, to her library. And it was a way in which Mary Leeper was able to educate herself. Anyways, cut, cut a long story short, Mary Leeper is now regarded by academics, particularly in Canada and the United States, as one of the most important women writers, women poets of the 18th century. And this woman was a kitchen maid at Weston, uh, and encouraged by Susanna, and um, they wrote poems to each other. And it's the most extraordinary collection of poems that were then published in Mary Leeper's book that tragically came out having been encouraged by subscribers, corralled by Susanna, two weeks after she died of tuberculosis. It's an absolute tragic story. But there's a series of poems in the notebooks um, between Susanna and Mary where they swap roles Susanna becomes the servant girl. Mary becomes the mistress. And they write these poems to each other, and they are outrageously flirtatious. And that's where I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> and, uh, watch this space, because there's an amazing story to tell of two women who couldn't break out of their, uh, yes. their culture. Yes. Susanna was never going to be more than the widowed wife in a nice house. However much, how intelligent she was, whatever aspirations she might have had, and this kitchen maid was destined to be nothing more than a kitchen maid. So these two people sort of reached out across the class divide, yes. encouraged each other, and flirted amazingly. Sorry, uh, extraordinarily. Anyway, <laughs> but, but so that's one of the reasons why, for me, the library is also a very special place, because this extraordinary liaison um, uh, this took, took place. place. Yes. But if you look in those, those books that are next door, yes, there is. There also an atlas. Yes, there's the... The early and a very early copy of Paradise Lost that we we knew about and actually we used, my father popped that in the in the in the, in the uh, safe so you know, no 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 weekend visitors would borrow it <laughs> you know, always, it's amazing the number yeah. of gaps that appear in the library yeah. and yes. Gertrude used to say well, Bernard her husband 
used to say that these uh, dandish men wearing white trousers dressed as if they were playing cricket, but they weren't playing cricket, would come for the weekend, often would come to stay when Sasha and Georgia, my grandparents, weren't there. And their suitcases tended to be rather heavier <laughs> on exit than they were when they arrived. But yes. there are still an, um, there's still a, an, amazing, an amazing collection of books left. So the short answer to your question is the books. The books. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming to Weston um, some years ago uh, on assignment and going to have a look at Edith's grave and Sir Shoveral as well. I think he's also in that same churchyard, yeah. isn't he? And I've also seen Osbert's grave in that wonderful cemetery outside Florence. Have you been, been no, there? But, but that's where he is. Amongst a whole mass of people, if anyone's wanting to write a really good book, it's called something like the Cimitero de Aliori. It's just in a suburb of Florence, and they're all in there. Mrs. Keppel, Harold Acton, John Pope Hennessy, um, all sorts of extraordinary people, and you could write a wonderful book as if they all... Well, then, Osbert apparently was sort of laying in state at Montefiore in those... He a dinner jacket. I remember there was a wonderful man called uh, Frank Magro, who was his oh, yes, yes. PA, I suppose, yes. or assistant, secretary, <laughs> some of the last years of of Osbert's life, who sort of guarded his, you know, memory, uh, you know, uh, uh, not not the word viciously, uh, very closely, put it that way. Yes. But I remember asking, I said, saying to, because obviously Osbert had uh, Parkinson's disease and was not well for the last you know, decade of his life. But I said, so I said to Frank, um, did Osbert, <coughs> you know, did he did he drink? I was interested to know his sort of daily habits. And he said, oh, for the last fifteen years of so Osbert's life, he never drank. I mean, really? What? Not even wine? But of course he drank wine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But, um, Frank Magro kept a flat at Monte Capone until it sort of the walls, you know, peeled so much he had to move out into Monte Sperteli. Yes. And uh, uh, the house was sold by our uncle, Resby. Um, he swapped it for a palazzo in Venice. Sounds rather sensible. But yes. they used to say that Monte Capone was such a a huge house, such an enormous undertaking that you could actually hear the white elephants coming over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you could. Yes. I mean, you're Edith's um, literary executor, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, Frank Magro was Osbert's, wasn't he? I yes, think, I yes think absolutely. Yes. And I have a feeling he may have left that in his will for my brother George. Oh, good. So, yes. Uh, we'll keep it in the family. family. Keep the family. <laughs> well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's been fantastic having Susanna and William here. Um, a really great treat to be able to to, uh, to grill them and to for me to get out of my system one or two outrageous questions I've been longing to ask, <laughs> and I hope one or two more gentle ones. But thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. <laughs>